here with us as we celebrate Children and Youth uh, Recognition Sunday. Um, if you could please stand with us as we begin our time of worship. Our call to worship is Proverbs 22, 6. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it.
uh, well, good morning. Look, I get nobody's enthusiastic about me speaking, but can I get a little more than that, please? Good morning. Thank you. You're all too kind. Uh, so believe it or not, well, first off, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh. I'm the youth director here at uh, Mannheim Grace. For those of you who already have that displeasure, I apologize. Um, so believe it or not, in Bible college, they never taught me how to do an under 10-minute devotional. Uh, curse them all that money down the drain. <laughs> but I'm going to try. Um, I was asked to speak about, uh, obviously, uplifting the youth and talking about how the youth can make a difference. And I was really struggling because everybody says, oh, we'll just go to that passage in First Timothy, but everybody does that passage in First Timothy. I want to be different. Um, so I went to the Old Testament. We're looking at the book of Daniel. Um, so just some, just some uh, backstory, some context to the book of Daniel. This is written during the Babylonian captivity. So all of the Jews were taken from Israel um, to Babylon. And in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king at that time, he chose the best. He chose the youngest and the brightest of the Jewish boys and said, I'm going to make these boys serve me. Um, so I'm going to be in Daniel 3, but just, some, uh, just uh, to set this up. There are four boys in particular that are named. There's Daniel, and then we have Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as everybody else knows them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were given those names as kind of a way for Nebuchadnezzar to say, you no longer serve your God. I'm giving you new names that glorify the gods I serve. Um, so it was almost a mockery to them. But one of the first things we see is right in Daniel 1, how these four young boys say, well, we're not going to eat the way you want us to. We're going to stand for what our laws say. And everybody knows that Nebuchadnezzar allowed it, and those boys turned out, you know, healthier and better. So it was already like a one against zero kind of thing. So within a few years, we have this, this next incident where Nebuchadnezzar, who I guess loves himself so much, says that he's going to build this giant statue it's really big, it's gold, and he's basically like, oh, I love myself so much that when everybody in my kingdom hears these certain noises, you have to bow down to this statue of me. Um, well, Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, refuse to do this. Um, they say to themselves, you know, we serve the Lord of Israel and no one else. So word gets back to King Nebuchadnezzar about this because you know, he has these people all over the kingdom who, who I guess have nothing better to do but to gossip and get back to him about it. And he gets really upset when he hears this. So starting at, uh, we'll go with, yeah, Daniel chapter 3, verse 13. Um, Nebuchadnezzar hears about them refusing to bow to his statue. And here it says, and I'm reading out the uh, ESV for anybody who wants to follow along in something else. It says, then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. So they brought these men before the king. And, oh, no, no, come on, don't do that. Don't do that, no, phone. I should have brought a real Bible. I'll be with you shortly. Oh, no. Uh, so Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image of myself that I have set up? Uh, now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, uh, harp, bagpipe, because there's some Scots in ancient Babylon, evidently, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, firing furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. 
Well, we all know the story after that. They get thrown into the furnace. Nothing happens to them. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar looks in, sees a fourth guy. Uh, theophany, picture of early Jesus Christ, or just an angel of the Lord. Um, technical stuff. And he is so amazed that he makes this decree that says, nobody is allowed to talk bad about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego under penalty of death. And this is an amazing story, but what makes it more amazing to me is that, and, and you know, we don't, we don't get this context just by reading that, but Jewish tradition and a lot of historians say that they were probably under the age of 16 when this happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, some Jewish scholars say between the ages of 11 and 13. Now, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I can't imagine being 11 and having a king threaten to throw me into a fire and being, being uh, willing not to back down from that. You see, we get so caught up in our church sometimes or in the American church in general thinking, you always have to be doing something. You have to be doing something to make a difference. Uh, you have to be going on missions trips. You have to be building shacks for people in, in Africa. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all they did was say, no, we're just going to stand on the principles of the Lord. And even though they were young, it ended up helping change the course of an entire nation. It changed a king's attitude. So that is my encouragement to everybody, especially to our youth. Sometimes all you have to do is stand firm on what you believe. You don't need to go do anything more than stand on the foundation that Christ has built for us. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Excellent. Uh, would you please stand with us as we um, continue in our time of worship together?
be seated. I'm going to steal your stool, Tim. Good morning, everyone. I'm not used to not having that little buffer, like that little clock ticking down, so I got, I usually have like a minute. That's okay. All right. And Josh, I hope your problem that you had earlier doesn't happen to me with the real Bible thing. That's okay. All right, thank you so much uh, to those of you who uh, have served in some capacity uh, with children and youth. Um, You know, as someone who has been a high school Bible teacher for over 20 years, and I was in youth ministry for eight years before that, um, you know, hearing letters that Tom, you know, read and and, uh, just seeing the impact, um, that's, that's that's the fuel that drives you, um, just seeing life change. And so uh, for those of you that have been involved, um, thank you for your service. And uh, for those that are kind of on the fence, you're not sure, hopefully after what you've heard this morning and, and uh, what the Lord's laid on my heart, um, maybe that'll give you the final push into um, getting involved because uh, there's a lot of opportunities. So anyway, with that in mind, let's, let's pray and then we'll, we'll dig into God's word. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this beautiful, uh, not quite fall, but fall morning. Um, Thank you for your grace. Thank you that in spite of what may be happening around us, uh, you are in control. And that in the end, uh, your will will be accomplished and you win. And so help us to uh, face... Um, face this world with courage, um, face this world with truth and love uh, and the hope of the gospel. And uh, so just give me the words to speak this morning, and I pray that uh, your spirit will work in all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So our study this morning is uh, going to be from Second Chronicles 34. And I, you know, wanted to replicate Josh. I respect him so much, so I got the jeans and the flannel because, you know, the cool weather. I was so excited for fall, even though fall doesn't start until Tuesday, right? I think it's Tuesday. is the 22nd. is the first day of fall, but that's okay. Um, but, yeah, so the Lord just kind of laid on my heart to talk about uh, King Josiah, and we're going to learn a little bit about him. Um, he, his time period is similar to ours. And just kind of a quick little preview, you know, he, he was in an era of moral decay, political corruption, uh, threats from enemies outside the country, a divided kingdom, and a spiritually complacent priesthood. Uh, so there may be some things that are applicable to us <laughs> that we can learn. And the cool part about this story is there is a link to what Josh spoke about with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we'll, we'll build that bridge at the very end. So you got to stay awake for the whole thing. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles 34, and if you want, actually, you can, you can go back a chapter to chapter 33 and get a little context here um, on Josiah and his life. So um, there is no juice showing from the clicker here. And if I turn it on, no, hold that button down. Hey, it did move. Okay. Yeah, we're good. Let me just try it real quick. Nope. So that's okay. Um, Yeah, it's not showing anything on the screen. So good hands, Josh. Did I just not have it turned on or did it shut off? Hey, coached soccer for 20 years, so that's pretty good. <laughs> Normally, I catch it with my foot. But anyway, all right. There we go. 
Okay, it's working. All right, so a little bit of context. Uh, grandfather was Manasseh, who was not a good man. At least he started that way. He ascended to the throne at the age of 12, and he reigned for 55 years. And you can see a little bit of his story in the, in the previous chapter. Um, so Hezekiah was Josiah's great-grandfather, and Hezekiah had torn down some of the pagan shrines and altars, and Manasseh built him back up again. So he kind of undid, uh, when Hezekiah was trying to bring the reforms into the nation, uh, Manasseh kind of reversed everything. Um, he practiced witchcraft. That's great. Um, he also sacrificed one son to the pagan god of Molech. Okay, so probably not a good example to follow. Uh, so he fell far from the example of Hezekiah. Um, he placed shrines of pagan deities in the temple. Think about this. Temple of the Lord. Not only did he put pagan shrines in the temple, either it was either him or Ammon, the son we're going to look at, who had removed the Ark of the Covenant and just kind of tucked it away in some storage shed. Okay, so the Ark of the Covenant wasn't even in the Holy of Holies at this time. And he had a lot of people that were innocent who challenged him, he murdered them, had them murdered, okay? Not a good guy. So that's Josiah's grandfather. So some of you come from some pretty dysfunctional homes. Let me know if yours is worse than this one. <laughs> like, oh, granddad. <laughs> yeah, we don't do too many family events with him. All right. So the next, uh, uh, the good thing is, okay, and this is kind of an encouraging point, uh, Manasseh was humbled late in his life. And so the last few years were actually good. But God had to take him to the very bottom. And so the Lord used the armies of Assyria to capture him. And if you remember the story, they had bronze chains, they, had, they put hooks in his nose, and they sent him to Babylon as just kind of like this political punishment, political isolation. So he was completely humiliated. And in that lowest of low places in this prison, and, and you know, the Babylonians, of course, were um, hum humiliating him as well in different ways, uh, he repents, prays to God, and God, in his grace and mercy, allows him to come back for his final days back to Judah. And so... Manasseh at least kept his word from that time of repentance. And so he tried to start to rebuild the city walls around Jerusalem. He tried to start to clean up, you know, the altars and the things that he had built up. Um, he unfortunately ran out of time. He passed away, okay? Um, so he, he just, but he did try to end well. And that was, you know, that was good. So this leads then to... Manasseh's son, which is Josiah's father, his name is Ammon. Ammon started just like Manasseh did. He was a completely evil king, and he only lasted two years. He, he uh, continued the sacrifices to these pagan gods, you know, with the Asherah pole, uh, Molech, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he eventually was assassinated by members of his own court. So his own people turned on him. And so it was quite the ugly scene. Um, he ascended the throne when he was 22, so he died when he was 24. So that's kind of, like, that's, that's some interesting family history, okay? You do Ancestry.com and you're like, oh, <laughs> wow. Um, you know, maybe they can't even repeat some of the stuff that your, your parents had done or grandparents had done. So that leads us to Josiah, who is coming into this fracas of a family, okay, this, this uh, yeah, of a, of a political situation, it was just a mess. So he was six years old. Think about that for a second. I'm sorry, he was eight years old. Did I put six? Oh, no, he was six years old when his grandfather Manasseh died. So he was eight, because Ammon served two years, so he was eight when he ascended to the throne. So maybe Manasseh, the last couple days his last year or two, was able to kind of input some spiritual truth and wisdom into Josiah. 
because Manasseh did end well. And so it's possible that maybe Manasseh was able to share what God did for him. Um, interestingly enough, it's through Hezekiah that Zephaniah, the prophet who wrote, you know, the, 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 um, the book of the Bible in the Old Testament, was a cousin to Josiah. Pretty good. And then we also have the high priest um, was a godly man, okay? Uh, his name was Hilkiah. His son is Jeremiah the prophet. And Jeremiah started to his, his ministry during the time of Josiah's reign. So kind of look at this collection of individuals that God has surrounded Josiah with, and there's some good, strong spiritual leadership. And so that I think that's reflected in Josiah's life um, at, with some of the decisions that he makes. So let's look at uh, just some of the things that Josiah did. <clears throat> So again, he became king at age eight after his father was assassinated. Just kind of think about that for a moment. The, you know, for an eight-year-old, okay, what they're processing, especially with the reality of how his father died. So um, that, that's a lot. And so you can see that they actually protect him. If you look at 2 Chronicles 34, we're going to start in verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight and followed the example of his ancestor, David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. During the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor, David. Okay, so just stop right there. So there's an eight-year kind of buffer in which Josiah, not a whole lot's happening. Probably some others that are in leadership who are taking, making some decisions and think about the turmoil that he just went through with the assassination of his father. So I think the court officials were protecting him a little bit. Now, as a young man, as a 16-year-old, he's emerging on the scene, and he comes out committing his way to God. All right? So he could have easily followed in the path of the evil examples that were before him. But instead, his heart was drawn. I believe God obviously had a very much a big plan of drawing his heart to his ancestor, David. And he had some family members, Zephaniah, Jeremiah was in the picture. Hilkiah was a good example. And so his heart, following these examples, started to follow God. And so at age 20, 20 to 24, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem he starts to destroy these altars to Molech. He destroys the Asherah poles, and he begins to restore the temple. Because the, the temple at that point had pretty much been neglected, okay? As far as, you know, the, the glory of, of Solomon's temple, it was just kind of falling apart. And if you, wanna, if you want on your own, um, the parallel passage here is in 2 Kings 22. There's a couple other details that are given uh, during this time period in Josiah's life. Um, if you ever want to see the parallel passage. But we're, we're, going to land, we're just going to focus here in Second Chronicles. So we get to verse 14. So if you want to follow along as I read um, verse 14, and, and what had kind of preceded this was, you know, Josiah's like, hey, this is the resources. He, he calls his officials, tells them to start rebuilding the temple, give them the money that they need, and let them do their job because the temple needs to be restored. So that's in the process. Verse 14. While they were bringing out the money collected at the Lord's temple, Hilkiah the, pro the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. So think about this for a second. It wasn't even in a place that they knew about. They're cleaning up the temple and they're like, what is this? <laughs> they found a copy of God's word that had just been shoved in a corner, shoved in a closet. And so, you know, this, the, his court official, uh, Shaphan, the court secretary, you know, brings, brings this copy to Josiah. He's like, I found the book of the law in verse 15 in the Lord's temple. Then Hilkiah gave the scroll to Shaphan. Shaphan took the scroll to the king and reported, 
Your officials are doing everything they were assigned to do. The money that was collected at the temple of the Lord has been turned over to the supervisors and workmen. And Shaphan also told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a scroll. So Shaphan read it to the king. And when the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair. Have you ever had a scripture passage that just jumps off the page and you're just convicted? It's just like, whoa, that hit, you know, like Hebrews talks about, it pierces to the dividing of soul and spirit. That's a place that no person can get to other than God in his word. And that's what happened to Josiah. So he's doing the right thing. He's making these good decisions. He's purifying the country, rebuilding God's temple, and he hears God's word for the first time. And he is just broken. He's broken. And he repents before God. And so he asks his staff, he's like, go find somebody at the temple that can, I, I need to hear from the Lord. He, he didn't even know if he, like, he, he repented before God, but he's like, I don't even know if I'm worthy enough to talk to God about this whole thing. And so he, he, he's like, I want to hear something from you know, one of his spokespersons. And so he, he sends his court officials, and they find a prophetess in the temple. And so her name is Huldah, the prophetess. You don't really see her anywhere else in Scripture. But God used her in this moment. And so in verse 20, 21, um, go to the temple and speak to the Lord for me and for all the remnant of Israel and Judah. Inquire about the words written in the scroll that has been found. For the Lord's great anger has been poured out on us because our ancestors have not obeyed the word of the Lord. We have not been doing everything the scroll says we must do. So Josiah knew immediately, I, I didn't know this before, but now that I've heard it, we're, we're in a bad place. We have messed up. And so Hilkiah and the other men went to the new quarter of Jerusalem to consult with the prophet or prophetess, Huldah. She was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, son of Harhas, the keeper of the temple wardrobe. And she said to them, the Lord, the God of Israel has spoken. Go back and tell the man who sent you. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this city and its people. All the curses written in the scroll that was read to the king of Judah will come true. For my people have abandoned me and offered sacrifices to pagan gods, and I am very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will be poured out on this place, and it will not be quenched. But, this is the, the good part. Go to the king of Judah, who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him. This is what the Lord says. The God of Israel says concerning the message you have just heard. You were sorry and humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this city and its people. You humbled yourself and tore your clothing in despair and wept before me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. So I will not send the promised disaster until you have died and been buried in peace. You yourself will not see the disaster I'm going to bring on its city and its people. And so they took her message back to the king. So the Lord decides in his mercy because of the response of the leadership, I'm going to stay my hand. Judgment's going to be delayed, okay, until this, this generation of leaders is gone, until Josiah is gone. And so Josiah, which I think is the appropriate response then in verses 29 and 33, he calls all the people of Judah and Jerusalem together, and they renew their covenant to God based on the law of Moses. Okay, they do what's right. They respond to God's mercy with obedience and action. And this is all a young man doing this. A young man who today would maybe not even be listened to in some churches. 
So one of the things he does is he realizes that Passover hadn't been celebrated in decades, possibly over a century. And so he reinstitutes the Passover celebration in chapter 35. Um, so at age 26, he's making these amazingly mature decisions. Going back to even when he was 16, committing his way to the Lord, attacking the evil, going and, and tearing down the evil, addressing the sin, being bold. And so he is doing all these things, you know, in these years that, you know, I, I look back at when I was in college and, you know, that whole time period, <laughs> made some dumb decisions. I think there's a few of us that could probably, you know, raise our hands in agreement to that. Um, I, would not, I was not in this place as far as where Josiah was. He, he, he was unique. Josiah even went to the point of returning the Ark of the Lord to its proper place in the temple again. He tore down those things that had been up in the temple, Lord. So the temple was finally getting back to the way it was supposed to be. Okay, He was doing a, a very good job in obedience to God. And the scriptures say in verses 16 and 19, if you want to look there real quick, um, the entire ceremony for the Lord's Passover was completed that day. All the burnt offerings were sacrificed on the altar of the Lord as King Josiah had commanded. All the Israelites present in Jerusalem celebrated Passover and the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Never since the time of the prophet Samuel had there been such a Passover. None of the kings of Israel had ever kept a Passover as Josiah did involving all the priests and the Levites, all the people of Jerusalem, and people from all over Judah and Israel. This Passover celebration took place in the 18th year of Josiah's reign. So he's 26. Okay. Going back to Samuel. So you're going back. Josiah's probably in the 600s. That's 400 years of history. Wow. Wow. What, what courage, what leadership. So the end of his days, as we start to, to wrap things up, if there was to be one decision that he made that you can look play, play Monday morning quarterback and say, you know what, probably shouldn't have done that, it was this. And it, unfortunately, was what got him killed. So geopolitically, what's going on? Egypt, not as powerful as they were in their years gone by. And Assyria was to the north. Assyria was a waning empire. They were, they were kind of on the, the tail end of their reign. Babylon to the east was a rising power. And so Assyria and Egypt were making an alliance. Well, if you know the history of Israel at, with the Assyrians. They were not friendly with the Assyrians at all. They hated the Assyrians. And so Josiah is like, I can't let this happen because I can't let Assyria last. He's seeing this as an opportunity for Assyria to be destroyed, not recognizing fully the threat that's coming from Babylon. So he decides to do this battle. King Necho, if you read the story, and we're not going to read the whole thing, he even says... The king of Egypt says, look, you have no business being here. I've received from the word of the Lord. This is not your battle. Go home. And Josiah doesn't listen. Okay, so he actually disguises himself because, you know, back in the day, the king would, you know, be in their royal garments and, or their warrior outfit. Okay, whatever that looks like. And so they were spotted. That way everyone else could see where the king was. He hides himself because he wants to get into the the fray, and he ends up getting shot up by a bunch of Egyptian archers, and he ends up dying, okay? But he was warned. And so the one thing you could say about Josiah is, here's Necho, who's saying, God gave me a vision. You shouldn't be here. Back off. Of course, Josiah, in, in that moment, you're probably thinking, okay, right, buddy, you got a word from the Lord. I am not going to pay attention to that. Didn't give him pause at all. So, you know, you can kind of analyze that one whether it's a bad decision or not. But bottom line, this was a man who had courage. And, you know, sometimes courage can, be, can lead to bad decisions. So with this loss, 
All the people in, in Jerusalem and Judah, they mourned for King Josiah. Even uh, the prophet Jeremiah mentions him in a lament in, Jer- in Jeremiah 22. Um, Zechariah 12, the story in Zechariah 12, this is crazy. This, that's a future passage talking about, so when Jesus comes back again someday, Lord willing, very soon, and Israel's going to recognize that he was their Messiah and that they had killed him 2,000 years ago. And the mourning that they're going to have, the Jews, on that day is similar to the grief that Israel had for when Josiah died because they knew they lost a good one. They were in deep grief, wailing and mourning. Not a single person was happy that he died. So the, to equate that with the coming Messiah is strong, okay, is strong. So what can we learn from Josiah as we wrap things up? I love the quote there on the left. You can choose courage or you can choose comfort. You cannot have both. So courage is not age-specific. We see Josiah at the age of 16 making some pretty radical decisions in the face of evil, in the face of cultural norms, in the face of people that were in the priesthood and places of power in Judah, he did what was right anyway. So courage is not age specific. Okay, and for the younger kids, you got someone being bullied in your school, stand up to them. Step in and intervene. Don't let your friend be bullied. Be honest, don't cheat. Even though that's the easy thing to do. Just copy your homework from somebody else or cheat on a test. Be honest. Stay pure in your relationships. Befriend those who are outside the popularity bubble in school. You know how all those cliques are. Have courage to go outside of your comfort zone and to do what is right. And for those of us that are older, the mob is going to get worse. This summer was just a test run. What's going to happen after the election is going to be worse. Are we willing to stand up against the mob, whether that's the social media mob or the real mob? Are we willing to speak truth even if it's not popular? Even if it may put you in a place that you may lose your job because of what you're going to say is right. Are you willing to protect your neighbors and stand up for them? We are going to lose the luxury of comfort. And so are you going to choose courage? And we need to live with zeal for the things of God. You've heard it time and again this morning. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. That's That's the engine that fuels life change, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we going to be zealous for that and have courage to share that with others? And for the older generation, invest in the young. Like Josiah, older generation here, my generation, we've made a mess of things. We need this younger generation to have courage because they haven't had the years of all the bad behavior that they can actually set new patterns of purity and courage and zealousness for God, zeal for God. So invest in them. We have needs here in this church. Get involved. No excuses. And to connect with what Josh was talking about earlier, Did you know that, so Josiah's son, after Josiah died, his one son was crowned king, but was immediately taken into Egypt as a slave because King Necho got revenge for Josiah kind of going after him. And so the next king that was set up was Jehoiakim. In the third year of Jehoiakim's reign, Babylon rolls in. So three years, essentially, after Josiah dies, the first of all the people are taken into Babylon. And you know who was in that group? Some of Jehoiakim's court officials, young men called Daniel, Mishael, 
Azariah, and Hananiah. So they probably were old enough to know and to watch Josiah in his reign. So you have Jeremiah the prophet, who till the end of his days stood alone often. He was connected to Josiah. Zephaniah, prophet of God, cousin to Josiah. He was bold in speaking the truth. And then you have those four young men who probably saw their king when they were boys stand up to evil. And so they go to Babylon and they say, nope, we are not bowing down. We're not doing it. Where did they get that from? So you don't know who the next Josiah is. You don't know who the next Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is. So quit seeking comfort. Start pursuing investment into the lives of other people. Because the Lord knows Okay, our country doesn't stand a chance unless there's a genuine repentance and a generation that's going to do things differently. We will not stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the mercy that you showed Manasseh you knew that Manasseh's grandson was going to do great things for you. And so you gave him a chance again. Thank you for that. Thank you for the mercy that you're showing us who maybe we've made mistakes and we've been selfish and we've sought comfort. Help us to make the most of the opportunity that your mercy has granted us. And I pray for the, the young ones in this, this room right now that are downstairs, that are in our families, in our neighborhoods. Help us to invest in them, to have your vision on what this next generation can do, to reset a new pattern of holiness and righteousness in zeal for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand with us? Mm -hmm.